Amen. All right, you can take a seat. Turn over to number 497, hymn number 497, The Master Hath Come, number 497. hymn this evening is going to be number 606. Hymn number 606, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me?
rescue thee from hell. I born, I born it all for thee. What hast thou born for me? I born, I born it all for thee. What hast thou born for me? And I have brought to thee down from my home above salvation full and free, my pardon and my love. I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What hast thou brought to me? I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What hast thou brought for me? Amen. Amen. I'm glad to see Brother James and Miss Kristen back. They were on a mission trip to uh, Philly and Washington, and big road trip. And with the kids there, the, the age of their children, I am sure that um, it was uh, probably a little more than just a vacation for the two of them. I bet that was real fun. And they, uh, I wish he had like a slideshow from his family trip, uh, at least like the look on y'all's face when your van was towed in Philadelphia and you didn't know where it was. You ever walk back to where you parked your car and it's gone? That would have been a good uh, testimony. I'm sure the Lord taught y'all something in that. Um, I did want to mention that we're having a camp, youth camp meeting immediately after we dismiss tonight. And on that note, our youth choir is going to come and sing Press On. Those of you kids that know Press On, heaven's not so far away. I think it's very fitting uh, considering that we had uh, the DECA celebration here, and I just wanted to say to those of you that helped, I know we have kitchen folks, and just the turnout we had, what a blessing. Uh, there were people in that family. Uh, I got a really neat note, letter, and uh, they were grateful for our church. And this was something that I think Stephen mentioned more than once to us. And uh, he just said that he saw... Lindsay Chapel being the hands and feet of Jesus. And I know we may not nail that every time, but I'm grateful for the sweet spirit. And, um, and really when we say it's a loss, it's a loss on our end, losing Larry and Lori. Uh, uh, it's just like I still think I should be seeing them uh, sitting down here. Uh, but, it, but they're not lost to us. We know where they're at. It's just our loss and, and their gain. And I had someone ask me, well... We buried them. Why, why do y'all think they're in heaven? Well, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so we, we, I do believe they're in the presence of the Lord. And heaven's a good place. Uh, if Lazarus was in, in the place there in paradise and knew Abraham and that kind of stuff went on, I don't see any reason why uh, eternal life celebrating in the presence of God it, I believe scripturally it begins as soon as I die. Now, that, sure, there's going to be resurrection and there's going to be uh, stuff after that. But when someone asked you about it, uh, in Philippians, Paul made it clear he looked forward to going because he knew he'd be in the presence of God. And so that's a blessing. We're going to sing Press On. And then we may end that with Jesus be Jesus in me. Kind of goes along with our um, message. Do y'all have an... I need... One of them right up here, please. Do y'all need that? One of y'all? All right. We're almost out of music. Most of y'all know that by heart, I think, right? Press on. Okay. Don't need it. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, here. Pass. You look right here, and you take that. One of them girls was pretty...
What a blessing to uh, have that, that truth. You know, eternal life doesn't start when we get to heaven. It starts when we trust Christ and He moves inside, take up residence. That's when eternal life starts. And it's just that in this moment, uh, we're in somewhat of some, uh, some fighting. The glory comes later right now. If Jesus is in you, then you've got a battle with your flesh. You're living in a hostile environment, the world, and you've got an enemy. It's like a, uh, the Bible tells us to be vigilant because we've got an adversary, the devil who's like a roaring lion. I pray that you'd be thoughtful and vigilant and serious because uh, life is not a trial run. Amen? And uh, we, don't, we don't get a redo. We need to be diligent and vigilant. Uh, to be to be on guard because uh, tell you what it's it's a whole lot easier you know God can heal us when we're chewed up it's a whole lot easier to avoid getting chewed up if possible <laughs> amen uh, tonight uh, many of you know we have been uh, the last two Sunday mornings I preached on the topic of evangelism and this Wednesday night uh, that will be happening again we'll be having uh, uh, some Bible study Dad will probably lead that he may. Uh, even hit up some of our men to share 
do pray for Brother Daryl. He's feeling a little under the weather, but I'd actually talk to Daryl about sharing a little bit about personal testimony. Don't know if he'll be able to do that this week, but for sure, um, I noticed that as I've gotten to uh, interact with our church folks, there are some of our folks who I have heard uh, share their testimony with people. And if you don't do that, you're missing out. The Bible says we're to hold fast our testimony. A lot of times, uh, the, the uh, idea of retelling what God has done in our lives is a way of strengthening our own faith, not just being a witness to others. And so that's going to be good and encouraging. So I want to challenge you, if you struggle with that, you ought to be here on Wednesday night. You'll get some encouragement that way. Uh, but tonight I'm going to go back to what now has been jokingly referred to as a loosely constructed series on Sunday nights of the Old Testament. You know, we left Elisha back there. Do you all remember? So we're going to go back to 2 Kings. And this is a message that's been brewing for a long time. 2 Kings chapter 4. And just in case you've forgotten because uh, the age of some of our audience, if you're older than me, then you probably have a hard time remembering some things. And we covered 2 Kings 2, a very interesting story, a message that had an alternate title that I referenced, uh, Don't Let Your Babies Be Bear Bait. Do you all remember that story? Yeah. Well, we're going to pick up, we're going to jump chapter 3. I will kind of review what that's about. But we find ourselves in 2 Kings highlighting the ministry of Elisha. Elisha was Elijah's uh, young heir, as it were, of the ministry. He was his young protege that followed him and served him. And now, after Elijah has took that chariot ride and dropped his mantle, Elisha is now the man of God for the tribes, uh, primarily the northern kingdom, the tribes of Israel. But we also see him interacting, even in chapter 3, and respecting and blessing uh, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. So, we will get into the message tonight. If you would, stand. And tonight we're going to look at a very interesting story. I titled the message to Justin this morning, Fill Her Up. Uh, because we're going to find a very miraculous story of God using the prophet Elijah to be a blessing to a widow in need in 2 Kings 4. And I believe we'll find some New Testament application to this Old Testament story. The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in, thy, in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. And thou shalt pour into all those vessels. And thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God and he said, Go sell the oil and pay the debt and live thou and thy children of the rest. Lord, we love you and praise you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for this story tonight, God. And we understand this isn't just a story. It's not just a fable. It's not just a parable, Lord. But this moment in history, Lord, where your man, Elisha, your man of God, um, made an impact in a family's life. And Lord, as we look at this, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would do his work in our hearts. Lord, help us to understand that we need your infilling, your power in our lives. And Lord, I just pray that my brothers and sisters in Christ that are here tonight would be edified and encouraged, that we would be filled with your presence, with your spirit. And Lord, that we would demonstrate the fruit of the spirit in our lives as there are those around us that need 
to see that. God, I do pray for needs in our community. We pray for the extended Dacus family as they adjust. Lord, I lift up uh, Brother Darrell as he's home. I pray that you'd put your hand on him. And Lord, I know there are many others uh, that need prayer. I do lift up Jim and Sarah as they plan on being back on the road and serving you and heading south and just pray protection for them this week. And Lord, we pray that tonight uh, that as your word is preached, if there's someone here that needs the gospel that's never been saved, we pray they would hear your word and your Holy Spirit would touch them. And Lord, we give you all the praise and glory and pray that you'd be honored, lifted up tonight. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. And I, I failed to mention, and so I'll just say this now as a reminder, <clears throat> before we close tonight, uh, even in our dismissal prayer, we need to be reminded of Brother Bob Williams. He, I, I, I forgot to pray for him, but we have been thinking of him, praying for him. He's having some cancer treatments, and uh, some of you remember Brother Bob, great dear friend, deacon in, from here in this church that's moved, but we want to lift him up. But let's get into the, into the message tonight in 2 Kings 4. We see uh, an interesting story, and some of you have heard this story. Matter of fact, uh, there's a financial freedom series that has some little 15-minute videos, and one of the very first one is a reenactment of this story. We, me and the kids popped it in last week, and it's just a little 15-minute kind of dramatization of what we read here. And so uh, we want to focus in on this uh, this young woman, this widow who has some children here. But it's interesting to note that as the inspired author has moved from, there in First Kings, as it ends, we move from Elijah and his ministry, and now we begin to see Elisha's ministry highlighted. And after we see him uh, receiving the double portion of the spirit there of Elijah. We see him uh, doing miracles like Elijah had done, splitting the waters of Jordan. He comes across. He does some big things. He fixes the water supply. I say fixes by God's divine direction. He, with some salt and really the supernatural power of God, the land is healed. The water is made uh, sweet, made clean to drink. And we see God using Elisha in supernatural ways. We then see some young people at Bethel mock Elisha and two bears come out and tear them, the Bible says. We looked at that the last message. But in chapter 3, a very large scale miracle takes place as the Bible explains about a rebellion of the king of Moab and what ensued after that was a... Uh, uh, a little confederacy of Israel, Judah, and Edom to come against Moab. And these three kings, they don't prepare and they get out in the wilderness. And before long, their troops, their animals, and even themselves, they are dying of thirst. There's no water. But they find, uh, the, they realize that Elisha is close by and they find him. And because of Jehoshaphat's presence, because there's a godly king amongst the three, then, then uh, the Bible says that Elisha had a musician come and play. You'll find this in chapter 3. And then God revealed to him the victory plan. And they dug trenches and God provided a massive amount of water, enough to feed armies uh, or to, to water armies and their animals. And not only that, he said, I'm going to give you victory. When the Moabite army saw the water where there had been none, when they knew there, it hadn't rained, and the Bible said it appeared to be blood to them, they let their guard down and said, they've all killed each other. And they trot down to examine why they saw what they thought was blood, and turns out to be a rout as Israel and Judah uh, eliminates the... Uh, Moabites, they run them back, and, and that story is recorded there in, in chapter 3. And it's interesting that right after a large-scale, multi-kingdom, international miracle where armies were watered by the power of God, now in chapter 4 we have this little, uh, it's interesting, this, this widow and her sons need this small need. Do you know many times we think that God is a God that can do major big things? 
But sometimes we fail to remember that he's also interested in little things. And, and can I just say this? I doubt this widow was very politically connected. It probably didn't make a lot of difference to her about the kings and the armies of the Edomites and the Moabites and the Israelites and the, 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 the Jewish army. I mean, I'm sure she was a godly woman and those things mattered. But all the while that was going on on a large scale, there's a little mini drama going on in one woman's home. And this was the problem. She had been widowed. Her husband had apparently had died young and left her with two children, two sons. And the Bible says here in our text that this woman, uh, she was a wife of the sons of the prophets. Her husband, if I can put it in these terms, was a preacher boy that had been under Elisha. Elisha was in somewhat of an authority position over a couple of what we would call seminaries. They're referred to as the sons of the prophets. Many people believe that these could have started after Jezebel had killed prophets, that many people think that kind of as uh, God's response to that, he raised up homes where young men with a godly heritage who wanted to serve God could come and be trained to be <clears throat> a prophet. One of those young men <clears throat> had died and left his wife and his two sons. So as we get into the story tonight, it starts with an explanation of her problem. This widow had a serious problem, a personal problem. And it starts with, I guess we could assume, a past tragedy. The Bible does say that death is an enemy. And it's important to note that death is no respecter of persons. Mortality rates 100%. And this young man feared the Lord, had a wife and kids, and for some reason, he died. We're not given any details about it, but can I just say this? The longer we live, the more we see that enemy death intruding into our lives and into our circles of friends, and we've experienced that. Well, this man had died. So there was that past tragedy of losing her husband, losing the father of her boys, I, I believe this young man was probably um, not expecting to die. That's not normally the way it goes. And it appears that he probably didn't prepare to die. I have a problem. I've been offered a lot lately life insurance packages. I have been. I mean, I get it. I don't solicit it or nothing. Triple A wants me to buy life insurance. Another company wants me to buy life insurance. Uh, but... I just don't feel like putting a bounty on my own head, amen? I, wanna, I want to uh, take care of my family if something happens to me, but in this story, this young man didn't apparently have a very good life insurance policy because he died and he left debt, the Bible says. And so now she's not only in distress because her husband had died, but she said, the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. You see, there was this present threat. She had lost her husband, but more than just being in debt. And you may say, well, man, Israel must not have had any good social services. Uh, there must not have been widow's benefits, social security, or anything like that. But it, it should be noted here that there's, no necessarily, uh, it, there's not necessarily an indictment on their financial uh, situation. It doesn't say that he was not godly. Elisha acknowledges that he probably was godly. And it should be noted that as God's people, she was a godly woman, her husband was a godly man. The debts that were incurred, whatever way they were incurred, was expected to be paid. Do you know that as God's people, we ought to pay any debts that we owe? Right. I say that because although this lists what was going on, you don't see Elisha and this woman railing against the system. Uh, a man had the ability to loan at some point, and either her or her husband had borrowed, and what had been borrowed needed to be paid back. We're to be physically, re excuse me, we're to be fiscally responsible. Financially speaking, we are to be faithful. In Luke 16, 10 through 12, the Bible says that faithfulness in finances, in, in this world's money, in many ways is a tr test 
for whether we will be faithful with the real treasure, the real things that are valuable. It is not a good witness for God's people to leave their debts unpaid. Now, that's not the message, but it's a point of the problem that she's expressing to the prophet that not only was her husband gone, but now she may lose her kids because of a past debt. Can I just say this? We as men need to take note of this. We put our family under bondage when we incur inordinate amounts of debt. The Bible says that the borrower is servant to the lender. And as God's people, we need to be conscious of our finances. I don't believe that we need to serve and love money. The Bible says the love of money is root of all evil. But can I just say this? As God's people, we should be faithful. Now, there's no indictment that this widow had done anything necessarily wrong. But because of the creditor coming, she was in danger of losing her sons. And so she cries to the man of God. She cries to Elisha. And can I just say this? Before we critique her husband, it ought to be noted the way the story ends. This woman is going to be just fine because her husband didn't have assets like a life insurance policy. He didn't have assets like money in the bank. He didn't have assets uh, like a big financial portfolio. But let me show you what he did have. He had a good name. The Bible says that she went to Elisha and she wasn't hiding who she was. She was saying, you know who I am. My husband was a man that feared the Lord. He had a good name. He had the fear of the Lord. He obviously had a good wife and one that cared for his sons. And he had a relationship with God and therefore he had a relationship with the man of God. So that she had an audience with Elisha. And to me, when you read the way this story unfolds, his very best life insurance policy that he could have was knowing Elisha and serving the Lord. Amen? Can I just say that in my personal experience, when Lauren and I have had to go through hard times, it is our relationship with the people of God that has been the biggest blessing in our lives. It has been the biggest blessing in our lives knowing that there are people that loved us and prayed for us and that should not be neglected when we look at her problem. She did have something. She had a relationship with the man of God, with God. So we understand her problem was serious, but now we see her approaching Elisha and a solution. The prophet gives her a solution. And once again, he does not rail against the lenders. He doesn't say, <clears throat> these evil, rich capitalists shouldn't take their money back from you. You're a widow. He, made, he asked her, first of all, Matthew Henry makes this note. He asked her, what do you have in, the, in your house? Matthew Henry believes she, he asked this because he said, I may not have this exact quote, but he said that those that were indebted... Those that were in need of necessity should not be enjoying niceties or commodities. What Matthew Henry was saying was, he, he thinks that Elisha is implying that if you've got a bunch of goods in your house that you could pay your debt with, let's start there. Isn't that interesting? Now, now, if that's the reason he asked, he said, what, what can I do for you? And by the way, that what shall I do for you? And he said, well, he didn't let her answer. But that was really a concern and acknowledgement that, yes, I know your husband. Yes, he feared the Lord. And yes, I want to help. What can I do? And can I just say this, that really, when Elisha asked that, it was more, we're going to see what God could do. You know, we can, our help is only, is very limited, but... He asked her, what can I do? And then he asked her, do inventory. What do you have in your house? And she didn't have anything. Sounds to me like her house was pretty much already empty. Now, the implication that Matthew Henry sees is that she probably already had sold everything that was of any value, except for this cruise of oil or a pot of oil. 
At this point, this story may sound similar. When Elijah had prayed a famine down, did y'all remember before Elijah prayed rain down, the Bible says it was Elijah that prayed that the heavens would be shut. And for three and a half years, there was no rain. But guess what? When he prayed and no rain came, he didn't have any water either. When the brook dried up, he was sent by God to Zarephath. And there was a woman there, and we preached on this last year, the, the idea... Uh, that he shows up and she's got one little cruise of oil and she's got a little bit of meal in the bottom of the barrel. Do y'all remember that? And he said, hey, make me a cake first. Do y'all remember that? To the widow. And she said, listen, this is it. I'm, you met me on the last day that I have anything to eat. We're going to have this cake. We're going to eat it and then we're going to die. And he said, no, no, feed me first. And then y'all can have something to eat. Now, in Elijah's case, do you know that that barrel of meal and that crucible, and the Bible says it wasted, not never disappeared. And so she was able to keep scraping the bottom of the barrel, and there was always enough. There was always enough. And she took care of the prophet, took care of her son, and we looked at that. Well, this story, in some ways, this miracle that Elisha is going to... Uh, to be responsible for, in some ways is similar because when he asks her, what do you have? And she says, nothing but save a pot of oil. Here's my inventory, Elisha. I have nothing but a pot of oil, not anything in the house. When she mentions this to him, he then gives her the solution. And I believe this is a solution that required some faith on her part. Because Elisha didn't do anything, really. He just gives her a game plan. He says, look with me in verse 3, Go, borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So listen carefully. <clears throat> he tells her how it's going to go down Right from the get-go. He says, that pot of oil you have, you're going to take that pot of oil and you're going to fill up all the vessels that you bring into your house. But you go borrow vessels, bring them in, shut the door, and then the miracle's going to happen. You're going to be able to fill up vessels with your pot of oil. This is God's solution to your problem. This is the miracle. You start pouring and it's just going to keep coming, Right? And keep coming. And listen, I've never seen any, I've seen tricks where guys do something that looks like that. The closest thing I've ever come to that was back when I was drinking Dr. Pepper or anything out of a can. Cans are amazing because you can be wanting every drop of the Red Bull or the Dr. Pepper and you can turn it up and it's gone. But then that empty can can slip out of your hand, bounce on your pant leg and three or four drops spill on your leg. I'm serious. There's more. Well, in a way, as she begins to pour, he's telling her there's always going to be more. Your pot's not going to run out, so go get some vessels. Have your, basically, go scour the neighborhood. Go to all your neighbors and have them loan you, have them give you some vessels. So... The game plan, the solution, he says, is going to require some participation on your part. I like this. He didn't say, you know what, you asked me for help, God can do anything. Boom! God just filled up the bank account of your creditor in your husband's name. The debt's been paid supernaturally. He could have done that. He's going to take care of it supernaturally. But he told her that her and her boys were going to have a part of the miracle. He said, you pour into those vessels, then you set aside that which is full. So she went out from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. Now that phrase, the oil stayed, it means that the, it didn't keep overflowing. Do you know that not a drop spilled out on the floor? Once the last vessel was full... 
And she said, bring me another one. And there was no more to fill. The miracle ended. That's what it means. The oil stayed. And so she goes and tells Elisha. And Elisha says, now you've got some, you've got a quantity of oil. Can I just say this? I would suspect that heavenly, divine, supernatural oil from God's hand would probably be the absolute best kind of oil you could get. So it was valuable. And he said, now you can sell that. So the miracle was going to require her to do something, do what she could. She was to go borrow vessels. And he says there's going to be a potential bounty. He said, don't borrow a few. He promised that all the vessels she brought in, if she, as she shut the door, they would be filled. Now this is where it differs from Elijah's miracle. Elijah's widow had a cruise of oil and a barrel of meal and that little bit was a little bit but just enough today and it was a little bit but just enough tomorrow and it was a little bit until the famine, we don't know how long, but until it was no longer needed, it was there every day. That, that widow never, never thought of doing um, a, a, a vessel borrowing fill up, it never says that that kind of thing happened. That was a picture of God supplying daily bread for Elijah and the widow in that way. But this widow, she had a big need. She had creditors and the debt was great enough that her sons were in jeopardy of being slaves. And by the way, we would be led to assume that even though it was Israel and not Judah, it would still fall under Jewish law, that her sons could be enslaved no more than six, seven years. Jubilee would have freed them. Do you all remember that rule about slavery in Israel and Judah? But still, if her sons were 10 and 12, and they were enslaved for seven years, that means she wouldn't get to see her boys grow up. So she had a immediate need that was much bigger than are we going to eat today she had the potential not just in the loss of her husband the losing of her sons and so when she had a big need in her personal life Elisha says God will meet it but you need to have a part in it and then we see God's supernatural provision as we look at the solution and God providing, it should be noted the question was asked, what do you have? And as we go along, I want to try to make some New Testament application to this story. Do you know that many times God wants to use supernaturally those means that may naturally be in our hands? And I, I, I think of examples in Scripture when Moses met the Lord at the burning bush, he had a staff in his hand. The staff of Moses, the staff of God. It would become an instrument, it would become a symbol of God's power. That shepherd's staff that Moses had used in so many natural ways would become empowered supernaturally by God. I think of David's sling that he had no doubt done many hours of target practice, I'm assuming... There were times out there that David uh, had hit uh, targets or maybe uh, knocked out a rabbit to have. I don't know, he probably didn't eat. I don't, I don't know what David was hunting, but I don't think David picked a sling up the first time, tried to hit something when he had Goliath facing him. That was a common instrument that he used. God used it in a supernatural way. I think of the little boy's lunch there on the hillside as... Jesus commissioned His disciples to feed the 5,000 and they provided what they had, a little boy's lunch. And how that that lunch became enough. I think of Peter's fish hook. Isn't it cool that Jesus had a disciple that had a fishing pole? <laughs> Do you know that in Matthew uh, there, I wrote it down, uh, maybe, maybe it was... Uh, yeah, Matthew 17, 24 through 27. They came and they were giving him a hard time about paying tribute taxes. And, and do you know that Jesus made a point that there was a sense in which it wouldn't, it sounds like it wouldn't necessarily be sin if Peter would have gotten away with not paying taxes. I'm just saying that's an interesting passage to read because Jesus kind of says, 
you know, <clears throat> the children don't have to pay taxes. But then he said, hey, but take your hook and your line and go down. Now, I, I know Justin's won money fishing, but the, I can assure you, Justin's fish are very expensive fish. But um, can you imagine throwing a hook in the water and when you pull the fish out, he just, he's like a piggy bank. He's got money inside of him. And not only that, that's exactly what Jesus said would happen. And he has a coin in his mouth. But the, the point is, is that God expected Peter to obey and go down and throw. Can you imagine when they said, hey, Peter, where are you going? Well, I, I'm going down, take this hook and line and throw it in the water. Well, why? Well, because I've got to pay my taxes. Well, why are you going fishing? Because Jesus said there's a fish with money in his mouth. Yeah. And he knew right where he was. It was almost like he had that vision finding uh, technology that they're using now. And he caught the perfect fish at the perfect time with the perfect amount of money in it. And that was a miracle. Peter had a part in it. And this woman has now been told, listen, you're going to pour out and you're going to, this is how your need's going to be met. It was super natural provision, but the question was asked, what do you have? God supernaturally empowered what she already had in her home. They're in her hands. And the details of this are important because we see a very humble source, a simple pot of oil. Then we see borrowed vessels. We see them asking, uh, the, the Lord asking them to to shut the door. Do you know this was not to be some kind of carnival show for everybody. This would be a private miracle that her and her sons would witness time and time again. Listen, her boys didn't have to be uh, in school. They didn't have to be science whizzes to know that what was happening as mom poured and poured and poured was the power of God. Can you imagine that amount of, of excitement as her boys watched her hands Pour God's oil over and over and over again. That happened that day. But it also says this, that when the vessels were full, the miracle was over. This was how the solution worked. I think it's an interesting comment that it says... She said unto her son, she had one son, I believe, bringing the empties, and the other son, the bigger son, stacking the full ones. And she looks at her littlest son and says, bring me another empty one, boy. He says, there's not any more. That's it. And then the oil stayed. Can I just point this out? The miraculous power of God was not limited God's provision was not limited on his end. It was only limited by her preparation. Wow. God's power wasn't the problem. And by the way, when I say problem, it's, there's no indication there was a problem. They might have had a hundred jugs filled up by then. I don't know. It, it doesn't tell us how many, but it tells us this. That the borrowed vessels were all full and she was still capable and ready of filling more. But see, the doors had been shut. And they'd already brought in all that they had borrowed. Y'all with me? And that was it. Now, I do believe that that little phrase, this details of this miracle are not given for no reason. I've often wondered, is it possible that God is more willing to give and bless than you are willing to receive? Is it possible? Is it possible that there's things that God would be more than happy to show up and show out in your life, blessing upon blessing, and it's just that our ability to receive, our willingness to prepare. I think the truth is many times we may not be thinking big enough. <laughs> Sometimes we don't think big enough of our God you know, I think about God supplying. I mean, God had just given a military victory and provided literally thousands of gallons, tons of water with no clouds and no rain. Filling up pots in a widow's house is no problem for God. Amen? And it caused me to think about the things that I worry about. 
Right? What are the things that, that I were? But you may say, well, now Jehoshaphat and, and the kings of Edom and Israel, they had a real dilemma. They, they were going to starve and be defeated by Moab. They were going to be killed. They were going to die of thirst. Now, that, that's a big deal. Now, this lady, she's just in a little bit of debt, and her boys may have to work hard labor for a couple years. That's not that big of a deal. But do you understand that in comparison, neither are a big deal to God. Neither is a big deal to God. And, and this is interesting to me. That... That truth that we see in James chapter 4 when he says you ask, uh, you, you have not, he says, because you ask not. He says you ask, not, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss. But that first phrase is a little sobering to me. You have not because you ask not. And can I just say this? A lot of times we just think about possessions but that's not the most valuable things that God's willing to provide. Do you know the Bible says that a godly spouse is from the Lord? I don't think most people even ask Him for one. It doesn't look like it. Uh, listen, uh, the, the Bible says, and I, by the way, don't look. If you're married, do not look around. I'm talking to single people for crying out loud. It's too late for you if you're hitched already. Amen? But Natalie, you ought not settle. Right? Right? Do you know that God is more than able to provide what you need? Amen. I mean, listen, I, I know uh, young people, uh, and, and I look at young people, Isaac and uh, Samuel, Jacob, Eli. Do, do you know that the world wants to tell you that God really doesn't get that interested in little things like relationships with some kid in Oklahoma? He can. He can be interested. He's willing my Bible says a prudent wife is from the Lord. I took him at his word and he was faithful. I saw that in real time. You know, if you think about, if you use your imagination and think about the aftermath of this story. She goes to Elisha and says, Elisha, they're all full. What do I do? He said, well, you t he, he, I, I think this is funny. He's like... This is why it's given to you, so that you go take care of the debt, so that's gone. Your boys will be safe, and then you can live off of all the rest. This is God's bounty for you. You can sell it, and you can live off all the rest. This is God's retirement program for you. Let's give the widow lots of credit. Let's say that she f had borrowed a hundred big vessels. Say they were big enough... That each one would net, let's say, $1,000. Let's use today's currency. If that's the case, she just racked up $100,000 with God's supply. Okay, so she pays off the creditors and she's got that much to live on. And I wonder if anybody might have said, maybe her boys got up older and said, Mom, um... Could you help me buy a house? In that case, she'd be able to say, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to, but praise God, Amen. yes, I can, because God provided. And she would have it, and it's not because... Uh, in that moment, God doesn't have to do a miracle 20 years down the road for her boy, because that day she prepared and received from God enough that day that she could do what Elisha said, live off the rest. But say she only had borrowed 10 jugs. You may say, well, in one instance, God really cared for her boy down the road. In the second instance, say there was only 10 jugs, she obviously wouldn't have had enough for that. But the truth is, whatever she did have was whatever she had made preparation to receive. Are you all with me? What my point is, is whether they had 100000 or 50000 or $10,000 worth of oil, it wasn't because God said, I'm only giving you this much. That's not the way the story reads. Elisha indicates that she had probably gotten plenty to live off of because that's what he told her. 
But Elisha does something interesting. Later at the end of his ministry when he's dying, you find this story also in 2 Kings. The king, Joash, comes to Elisha and he knows that Elisha is dying. And by the way, Elisha got sick and knew he was going to die, not because he had a lack of faith. This is a rabbit trail, but can I just please touch on this? Just because someone's sick or just because someone's in a hospital doesn't mean they don't know God or they don't have faith. Amen? Elisha had plenty of supernatural power. After he was dead, he raised a guy from the dead. But when it was his time to go, God didn't bring a chariot of fire. God let him get down and sick, and he called the king. The king comes, and he says to the king, bring a bow and arrow, and as you smite, as you shoot, that's going to be symbolically... A picture of God giving you victory over Syria. Eli I went back and read it today. Elisha actually told him, this is going to be a little symbolic exercise. I'm going to bless you, Joash. I want you to get your bow and arrows, and I want you to shoot. Shoot. This is my kind of... I mean, he had a deathbed with a shooting range. That's what I want to have. Right? Coming to visit you, preacher man. Great. Did you bring your bow and arrow? <laughs> so he shoots. And, he, and the very first one, he says, that's going to be a victory at Aphek. Now shoot. And so he gets another arrow and blink. Grabs another arrow and blink. And then he sets the bow down. All right, boss. And Elisha was mad. The Bible said Elisha was wroth. And he said, look, because you shot three arrows, God's only going to give you three victories in battle and you're going to lose the war. That's what he tells him. I'm paraphrasing. But in 2 Kings 13, 15 through 19, Elisha had said, shoot, can I just say this? You may say, well, why? If God tells you to do something, if the Word of God, if the man of God... Listen, the king had been given a God-ordained... Day at the range, he was told to shoot. And he stopped after three shots. And Elisha was upset about that. And he said, all you'll get is three victories. Isn't that odd? In t tonight's story, we see the widow being told, don't borrow a few. If your blessings are few, it's on you. Because God's going to bless you today. Be ready for it. Prepare for it. She may have said, well, I, I didn't have any vessels. No, he understood that. But he said, go and borrow. And by the way, if they were willing to go out in faith, in my mind, I think she could have probably said, hey, Miss Sarah, if you'll give me all your pots and pans, I'll bring them all back. And by the way, I'll bring one of them back full of the best oil. You won't have to go buy any for a month. I'll, I'll do that for you. But I need to borrow all your vessels. Right? I mean, she could, I'm just using my, that's what they could have been doing, right? But, and as they did that, neighbor to neighbor, Miss Sue, can I borrow all your, I need all your pots and jugs, and, and if you'll give them to me, I'll bring back, and by the way, I will bring them back. Uh, they were borrowed. And the whole reason she's doing this, because she's faithful to pay her debts, and she's, by the way, I'll bring you back enough, or you, you'll have some oil too. Can I borrow everything that I can hold oil in? Can I go and do that? But at some point... As they brought load after load in, sooner or later, one of the boys goes, you know what, I'm not going to no more neighbors. Like, Come on, Mom. Like, this is probably good. Right? It could have been very arbitrary. I don't know where they... I don't know if they had a preconceived number in their head or maybe they just filled the kitchen floor up. Right? But at whatever point... They stopped. God stopped. That's the way it worked. And this isn't the only time this happened. So in the story on the Sermon on the Mount, or excuse me, the story of the feeding of the 5,000 there after that, you find that they take the little boy's lunch and Jesus blesses it and breaks it. Do you all remember the story? And that day, what was the instrument that God used to do the miracle? You know, Moses had his staff... To, to make the blood. What was the instrument of the miracle power on that day? It was this. 
It was his disciples' hands. He broke it, and he blessed it, and he gave it to them. And listen, I believe that as he tore and handed to Peter, that chunk that he tore kind of magically began to grow in his palm. And when he handed it to Peter, it was just about as big as it was when he tore it the first time. And when he turns over to John and he tears it, it's just about the same way. Now that would be awesome if Jesus handed you... I mean, he had 12 disciples, right? The fact that the lunch even made it into the 12 men's hands was a miracle. But then he says, now you break it and give it out. Okay, have y'all ever thought about that? That means that, that Peter, when he received it, he did what he saw Jesus do. And he had the same effect. Ho, 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 ho. And all of a sudden, that hillside picnic became Lambert's home of the throat roll. Oh, here's you a bread, here's you a bread, here's you a bread, here's you. And it just never ran out. That's what the Bible says. Am I right? Am I right? I'm right. And it was miraculous. It was like manna from heaven, but instead of falling down like dew and showing up to be gathered, it was supernaturally provided in their hands. You've read the story, right? Can I point something out that we sometimes miss? When did God stop doing the miracle? Do you all know when? Let me give you some wrong answers. When everybody was fed. That's wrong. That's not when the miracle stopped. When God provided 2,000 calories per head as the USDA determines. That's not when it happened. When did the miracle stop? Anybody know? Do you all know when? Whenever the disciples decided, can I just, this is, in my mind, I think there were some disciples, like Matthew, the tax collector, numbers guy, who was like, wait a minute, I've got a row of 50, so that's one, two, three, one, two, hey, that should feed all of y'all. <laughs> Maybe, I mean, Jesus might have had a tightwad disciple that was like, okay, this group, but I think that some of the disciples were like, whoa, -hoo -hoo -hoo! Who wants one? You may say, why do you say that? Because when they were done and everybody was fed, there were 12 basketfuls of fragment. That meant somebody overdid it a little bit. But when Jesus had been the one to give the order, you feed them, he always backed up their generosity. As long as they were willing to give, He was willing to provide. As long as they were willing to give, He was willing to provide. And if one group was stingy and everybody ate, and man, my group only had no leftovers, right? Listen, my dad, if he was one of the disciples, he would have been the guy saying, hey, your kid's sitting on a bun, I ain't giving you no more. <laughs> right? Your kid has bit two biscuits and ain't, eat, ain't eat either one of them. It's the only flavor we got. You don't get any more. Right? But some of those disciples were generous. Listen, as long as they were willing to tear, God was willing to bless. They, do you know that as long as the widow was feeding Elijah, she could count on having daily bread the next day? I'm not a name it, claim it guy. But can I just believe that I personally think God... Make sure to take care of you when you're willing to give out like he asked you to. And when God said, pour, then she had the ability to pour. It wasn't her power, it was God's power because she was acting in obedience to God. And so as long as she was willing to pour, it filled up. And all of those neighbors that they had borrowed from, their vessels went out empty and they came back Full. She had something to, to sell. She had a bounty. I just wonder if God says that we're to trust Him to provide, then why do we get stingy? And, and I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about money. You know, sometimes it seems like God is stretching us, right? Seems like God is extending us. But if you're in the will of God, you can trust God's provision. 
And, and listen, God cares. We're to cast all our care upon Him, for He cares for us. But the Bible says we're to bring things to Him. Listen, can I tell you about things that you and I have that are borrowed today? Tomorrow. Tomorrow's a vessel, and it's borrowed. And we can either fill it with junk, or we can allow God to fill it with supernatural blessing. I really believe that. And you know what a lot of us do? We get prayed up, and we come to church, and God speaks to us. Amen? I'll tell you this, every time, every time our kids come filing up, not even the singing part, just the filing up, because I remember how ornery and contrary I was when Miss Twilight tried to make me sing sometimes. Mom would ask me, and I see our kids with joy. Man, that just blesses me. And on Sundays, I'll be real honest, I get a blessing. But you know, I think God can, is totally capable of blessing me on Monday too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or Tuesday, or Wednesday, or Thursday, or Friday. You know what's sad though? Some of us, we have pretty low expectations on, our, on the supernatural. Like God, if you'll show up really, if you'll just show up about once a month, I don't really need a whole lot more than that. Can I just say that's wrong? That's wrong. Our, our days, our time, we're to be redeeming the time. How do we redeem the time? He says, redeem the time for the days are evil. In Ephesians 5, about verse 16, it says, redeeming the time. We're to walk circumspectly, walk wisely. Do you know that you don't have the commodity of just throwing your days away? We are in debt. We've talked about the gospel, and I know it's getting late, but I need to close with this application. Paul said, I am a debtor to the Jew and to the Greek. You've received the gospel. You You've been filled with the Spirit, and you're not giving it out? And listen, some of you can't shine your light because you got a bushel of fleshly behavior covering it up. you got a bushel of bitterness covering it up, but you're not to hide your light under a bushel. Trust me, the oil won't burn out. Let it shine. Some of us, we act with our spiritual life like we're going to get all used up. Right? And can I just say this, if you're, I do know people, sometimes I worry about dad burning his candle at both ends. Right? But until I find a 70 year old in better shape, I'm going to let him do what he's doing, amen? <laughs> you know what, I lived my life watching God pour blessing into a home that kept pouring out. I did. And I want to be a vessel that God can use. But you got to be willing to be filled. Isn't it sad that there's a lot of blessing? I don't understand exactly what this means. But when James says, I understand, God's omniscient. He knows everything. God's sovereign. But James says, you have not because you ask not. tells me that when I stand before God in judgment, it's not just sins of commission. It's not just things that I mistakenly uh, or sins that I got engaged in and did. But there's going to be some responsibility for things I didn't do. And he says, some things you won't have because you don't ask. Am I going to stand before God and Him show me what could have been? Did you settle? He had a supernatural supply. And guess what? It would have been your blessing. Well, yeah, you know what? We stopped at 10 jugs because really God just was bugging us to go and borrow vessels. And I don't want to go door to door and borrow vessels. It's your loss your loss I mean just to keep pouring out every and can I just say this I've watched do you know usually in churches and this is not too far different in our church usually 5 to 15 percent of the people do 95 percent of the work but you know what I've seen do you know I want to be part of the working part you would think that the non-working people are the happiest because they're not doing anything that ain't that ain't right Generally, the ones that are serving the Lord are the most blessed. Amen. Generally. But you know what the devil wants you to do? The devil wants you to get to, you to looking around and thinking about other people. Do you know that woman, she just brought what... She, she did what God said, brought it in the house, shut the door. Do you know they might have stopped because it looked silly? I don't know if she told her boys, but if she had little boys and she told them, I'm sure the story leaked out. We need to borrow all of your milk jugs. Why? Well, because mama's little pot of oil is going to fill them all up. That's what the prophet said. 
<laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Well, here, I'll give you a couple. We need all of them. I mean, I don't know how her boys were, but we're going to fill them all up. You know, after they carry load after load into the house, do you think somebody started going, you silly kids, there's no way there's enough oil in that place to fill up them jugs. Do you know at some point she had to say, kids, it doesn't matter what everybody's saying out there. Let's do what God said. Let's get in the house and let's trust His supply. He'll take care of us. See what we're going to do in here? It's going to be a blessing out there, but we've got to shut the door and take care of it in here. This is another application. Listen, dads... Don't get so busy worrying about out there that you don't take care of what's behind your door. Good. Amen? Good. The miracle happened behind closed doors. Amen? Do you know a lot of times we can't pour out into other people because we're not receiving from the Lord in private. Our public ministry will always be limited by our private devotion. In 2 Timothy 2, 19 through 21, he says there's many different kinds of vessels in a house. So I don't misquote it. He says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Did you know you're a vessel? You're a vessel. Are you prepared for the master's use? How does the master use a vessel? That means you're allowing the master to decide what's going in it. Christian, your ears and your eyes, they're not yours. They're the Lord's. You're to yield your members as instruments of righteousness. God wants your mouth to be speaking truth. Dad preached on it this morning. God wants you to be an ambassador. He wants you to be a minister of reconciliation. But you've got to be a vessel that can be filled with the Spirit or you won't be able to be used by the Spirit. You cannot accomplish God's work in the flesh. I'm going to ask Miss Sarah to come to the piano. Do you know, if we use our imagination, I wonder if those two boys ever said, well, there's still people that are more blessed than we are. I guess God just didn't like us as good as... Do you know the Bible says God's no respecter of persons? I wonder if those boys ever conversed about the bounty that they had received. I wonder if any of them ever said, hey, you know what? We're blessed, but we'd have been a little more blessed if we'd have just been a little more diligent to get some more vessels. I mean, she said, bring me another one. Mom, that's it. That's it. And listen, I know there's going to be a day when our turn's over. But I don't want God's power in my life limited by my lack of preparation. I want to be a vessel He can use. And you may be like me. There may be things in your life where you're thinking, you know what, I'm only giving God so much. Some of you, you only give God a couple hours a week. You don't ever get in the Word other than that. And God still loves you. You're His child and He'll speak to you every chance you give Him. But why not give Him everything? What if I gave him everything? I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Some of us might need to be reminded that there, there's a problem around us. And only God's power is the answer. The solution will not come to your problem because of your ingenuity. The real solution will not come because of your charisma, but it will only come through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. The value was not in the bar borrowed vessels. The value was in that supernatural oil. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, this message has been aimed at us that are saved believers, but can I just say this? You cannot please God in your own strength. You cannot meet God's requirement 
by all the good that you find in yourself, that will never suffice. The Bible says that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Are you saved tonight? If you've never been saved, God will save you. Can I just say this? Based on the Word of God, He's willing to save you. Would you be saved? If you trust Christ, if you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the Bible says you can be saved. Have you been saved? The invitation never closes here. Don't leave if you need to be saved. She's going to play another verse of invitation. If you don't come, we'll close this service. Just a few more moments and you'll close the service. you're not saved tonight, there'll never be a better time. The Spirit of God's dealing with you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you for that powerful, powerful message. I love to say this. People that say the Bible is boring never read the Bible. Powerful, powerful stories that God has given to us. Glad you came to be with us tonight. You can never get enough of the Word of God. I want to ask Brother Jerry Frazier, if you will, to make your way to the pulpit to uh, close our service. Pastor Clay is going to be meeting with those of you that are going to church camp and the sponsors uh, and even the parents, if possible, right here as soon as we say amen. So if everyone else will exit the sanctuary as soon as possible so they can get that meeting going, it would be a great blessing. Look forward to seeing you all on Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock, Bible study here um, in the sanctuary, and hope you'll come be a part of that. All of you men, uh, Tuesday evening, 6.30, men's meeting in the fellowship hall. Going to have great fellowship, always have a great meal, uh, and that meal will be served at 6.30 sharp, and uh, then we'll have a Bible study after that. So that's this coming Tuesday evening at 6.30. Put that on your calendar. Brother, would you dismiss us, please? It's been a good day in the Lord's house. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to come to your house and, and worship you, Lord. We praise you. Uh, we just... Uh, love you so much, Lord. Help us to love you more. Help us to follow your will, Lord. Help us to be a witness unto the world that we might spread your gospel to each and every person, Lord. Help us to be bold. Help us to uh, let that oil continue to flow from us, Lord, and that we might be, uh, we might be a, a light unto the world for you, Lord. But we don't always do that, Lord. We, we, we're sorry for that. We, we ask for your forgiveness when we don't do what you say or, or come short of what you would have us to do, Lord. But we, we, uh, we want to continue to work towards the, the goal of, of salvation in your, in your kingdom, Lord. Watch over, us we go through us, watch over us as we go through this week, Lord. Give us safety. Thank you for all your many blessings. Thank you for Jesus in his name. Amen.